Okay, hello and good afternoon here from Delhi uh, Connected. Warm welcome uh, to our today's web talk, Meet the Big Four Public Research Organizations from Germany. My name is uh, Dr. Katja Lasch and I'm heading the German Academic Exchange Service and the German Center for, research, uh, for Innovation and Research. So this is the first event of a web talk series um, where we talk about research careers in Germany and I'm quite happy that we have a distinguished panel today with us and that we will discuss a bit how the research landscape is structured and what are opportunities in the big four research institutions. In the few next days, we also offer an outlook and insight uh, in funding opportunities and research careers in life sciences and social science and humanities. So please look at our website if you're interested in more specific information on funding agencies and on these two fields. It might be interesting that you join us. The event is hosted by the German Center for Research and Innovation, the Vihar New Delhi and the German Academic Exchange Service, DAD. The DAD is worldwide known as the largest funding organization for mobility. And in India, we fund scholarships, fund cooperation projects, and inform about Germany as a study and research location. The DVH, the WIH, is a platform for exchange and networking between the Indian and German scientific and academic communities, and it covers a broad range of research topics covering fundamental as well as applied research, and we will see this also today uh, in, the, in the talk. We are funded by the Foreign uh, Federal Office, and our responsibility is also to inform about research opportunities for PhDs and postdocs, and that's how the two institutions come together. Uh, let me briefly introduce you with some key facts, the German research uh, landscape and uh, give you a lead in today's web talk. So if you look at the German research landscape, we have more than 1000 publicly funded research institutions. It's quite a large number um, and our research expenditure is standing at the currently at 3.2 of the gross domestic product um, and we're reaching um, more than 110 billion euros of research investments and there has been a significant increase in Germany. So Germany is um, an important player in the international research landscape. We have a lot of institute, we have a lot of R&D staff, as you can see in the slide, and we have quite a strong international cooperation. And I think we will see also in the web talks today that attracting international researchers, cooperating with uh, um, international researchers, and especially also with India, is very important for the German research landscape. Now, to give you a lead in, one has to recall that we do research in Germany in three pillars. So we look at higher education institutions. Um, this we will not tackle today. These are the classical universities, so we leave them out. Uh, there is research done in non-university research institutes, and that's the focus topic of uh, today. Uh, and then there's also done research in companies and industrial research. And to give you an idea, nearly two thirds of the research funds in Germany are provided by industry or um, uh, the expenditure is done in industry. The German research landscape is quite uh, complex and a bit confusing. So we have a lot of players, as you can see in this slide, um, who uh, key into this 1000 research institutions plus the companies. So it's quite complex and today's web talk serves two purposes. We would like to give you a bit of lead through to the research landscape, seeing a bit uh, from the big four research institutions who is doing what. And secondly, we would like to talk about uh, opportunities and research uh, careers opportunities offered by these institutions, especially for Indian scientists. And who we are talking today about, so we have here a distinguished panel by representatives of the Max Planck Gesellschaft, the Leibniz Association, the Helmholtz Association and the Fraunhofer uh, Gesellschaft. And I say hello to Germany, all four of them are placed in, in Germany, um, from Mainz to Munich and Berlin. Uh, glad that you're joining us to say, today and to give you an uh, impression. So today's panels represents 275 research institutions with a research funding of 2.4 billion research. And uh, the people you see here are talking about uh, institutions who host currently 117,000 researchers. So I think we have a uh, two quarter of the German research landscape present in four people here, and not to raise the pressure on our guests, uh, uh, but we can give you a quite comprehensive overview uh, today with this uh, panel. So I would like uh, everybody, please ask your uh, uh, questions in the chat. We will take them up during the discussion. And now I'm glad that uh, to welcome our four panelists. So first greetings to Munich, Dr. Christiane Haub, 
who is uh, connected from the unit for international relations and who is a policy offer for, for cooperation with Asian countries in the Max Planck Gesellschaft. Um, and she's also charged in postdoc and group leader program. So she has a good uh, insight into career development perspectives uh, on early career research uh, stage. And um, pre previously she was working with the Technical University of Munich and she holds a PhD in Chinese studies. So a strong connection to Asia. Christiane, welcome to the panel. Yes. Secondly, I welcome Dr. Almut Wiedholz Eisert. She is connected from us from Berlin. Uh, she is working in the International Affairs President's Office of the Leibniz Association and has been responsible for international scientific relations with the regions of Asia, Australia, Sub Saharan Africa, Canada, and the United Kingdom. So she nearly covers whole the, all of the world at the Leibniz Association's head office since 2012. She uh, read political science in Tübingen, Bonn, and the uh, USA, and she earned her doctorate from Oxford University. Almut, warm greetings to Berlin and welcome to the panel. We have with us Alexandra Rosenbach, who is the Deputy Director of Communication and External Affairs at the Helmholtz Association. Uh, she has this pos in this position since 2017. She is responsible for the development and implementation of the association's internationalization strategy and its international funding programs, amongst others. Prior to that, she was head of the international relations at Maastricht University in the Netherlands, and she holds a BA in German and English studies and an MA in media culture from Maastricht University. Alexandra, welcome also to you to the panel. Last but not least, Ms. Mm -hmm. Yasmin Avan, who is the Corporate Communication and Employer Branding Officer at the Fraunhofer Institute for Experimental Software Engineering. Uh, but she will talk also on behalf of the whole Fraunhofer Gesellschaft. She is responsible for the corporate communications and marketing measures with the Fraunhofer Institute. Um, as well, she is also responsible for employer branding and recruiting activities. So you can give you an insight what to do and what not to do while applying to Germany. She works closely together with the Fraunhofer headquarter, which is placed in München, and plans and executes respective actions to attract, motivate, and hire new talents in the field of software engineering and informatics. Yasmin, greetings to Mainz, and warm welcome to the uh, panel. Now, uh, we would like to have an open discussion today. So uh, this is how it will go. Uh, we will have a discussion amongst the panel and try to feed in all your questions from the chat. So please type in your questions in the chat and I will take them then up in the discussion. So I would like to start um, um, with a brief introduction of the institutions and maybe we start in the south of Germany with uh, Christiana. Maybe in a nutshell, in three to five minutes, could you explain us what is the Max Planck Gesellschaft, what the Max Planck Gesellschaft is standing for and what your institutes, which are spread all over Germany, uh, are already doing? Thanks for asking and give me five minutes to answer that because I think it takes hours to explain all of that. But well, Thank you very much to um, have the opportunity to represent the Max Planck Society. So, um, we are, so the Max Planck Society is the organization for basic research in Germany. So, if you really want to dive deep into uh, research and if you want to explore things that are at the edge of science or still uncovered, then Max Planck Society is the place to be. The Max Planck Society is celebrating its 75th anniversary this year. And as early as 1948, the founders like Otto Hahn, for example, who was the founding president at that time, formulated the basic principles which are valid uh, till today. So one of it is that Max Planck Society should do cutting edge basic research, strictly curiosity driven and quality orientated. Then also huge, a big important principle of their autonomy. So scientists should decide upon science, not politicians or whatever. Then um, one value we, we really um, uh, have to today is that the, the Harnack principle, which means that Max Planck Society is uh, funds people, not programs. So we are not a pro program funding agency. And we have this very long trust system with significant core funding for high risk projects, which maybe is not relevant this long lasting funding for you as a postdoc or PhD candidate, 
but for our directors or the, or the professors working at the Max Planck Society, um, it's still important because you get, if you are hired as a Max Planck director, then you get a funding for about 25 years and you can rely on that. These principles are working very well till today and make um, the Max Planck Society as one of the most successful um, research organizations worldwide to date. 30 of our researchers received a Nobel Prize, five in the past three years. So next Nobel Prize is still announced pretty soon. So maybe <laughs> we will see what's going on. Only the University of California and Harvard are head of the Max Planck Society in the number of um, Nobel Prizes. Since I've seen in the chat a lot of questions like, can you tell me the best place to do microbiology or astronomy or things like that? I like to tell you that the Max Planck Society, to understand it well, is that that is not a one Max Planck Society in one building where you do research, but Max Planck Society is uh, divided in 48, no, 84 um, institutes, which are spread all over Germany. And if you want to find the best place for your research, I would advi like to advise you to go to our website, um, mpg.de, where you can find the name of all these 84 um, institutes with their field of research, and then you maybe look which field of interest you have, and if, it's, if this research topic is covered by the Max Planck Society. Because we are cover, covering almost all science uh, uh, research fields in science and humanities, starting from anthropology or astronomy, biomedicine or chemistry, and it's very hard to explain all the little details in a five-minute presentation. And maybe also important for you to know is the most common language in our institute is English. So if you want to come to a Max Planck Institute to, to conduct your PhD or postdoc research, then you're pretty well, uh, pretty will find pretty well um, I'll find out that most of our scientists talk English to each other. So, so you don't need to know German to do research there. So maybe I start, uh, stop here and. Thank you, Christiane. It's a good point already. English is possible. Let me let me ask one question before we jump into the next uh, next presentation. Um, so very often I hear Max Planck is only for natural sciences. No, in, in India, when I talk to to researchers, is that true? Are you just looking into physics, astrophysics, nuclear? So which are the the fields, or can I do as a lawyer something also with Max Planck uh, Society? Yeah, thanks for asking. Indeed, most people are aware that um, Max Planck do research in natural science, but this is not true. Max Planck Society is divided in three sections. So these are like the faculties in universities. One is the, of course, um, chemistry, technical, physical section where you can find uh, um, large scale astronomy or things like this. Then there's a, a strong section on biomedicine sci uh, science. So um, but also humanities and social science, as I said, anthropology is quite strong or even uh, legal science. So, um, Black Society covers all fields of research. So I think to all those in the questions who ask about social sciences and uh, also uh, so there's a good place maybe to look if you look into the basic research in these subject fields. Thanks, Christiana, for that brief uh, um, look into into the Max Planck Society. So I think I would jump to the other end of the spectrum, uh, which would be the Fraunhofer Gesellschaft, Jasmin. Uh, maybe you can elaborate a bit what is the difference to Max Planck, what you're focusing on in the Fraunhofer Gesellschaft and explain our audience a bit uh, why we have a Max Planck Society and then a Fraunhofer Gesellschaft on top. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, yes, first of all, um, the difference between Max Planck and uh, Fraunhofer is that, as, um, as we just heard, uh, the Max Planck Society is focusing on um, basic research. We here at Fraunhofer Society are focusing on applied research, which means, which means that we bridge the gap between industry and science. So um, there's much more focus on uh, industry, and we also work together with industry partners. Um, Fraunhofer's mission, therefore, is to uh, work for the good of the society as well as industry. And um, this also goes together with our, with our new claim, which is called uh, Change Starts With Us. Um, here at Fraunhofer, um, we um, have about 30,000 employees working for us. Uh, which is quite a number, and um, all over Germany we have 76 institutes which are spread 
um, and they are, are focusing on different uh, research areas, which means they go from just like in my institute, uh, informatics, software engineering research, but um, they also reach up to biology, also uh, organizational development and uh, chemistry. So there's a broad range and uh, we are focusing on all that. Um, in our case, at our institute, uh, which uh, involves about 250 employees here in Kaiserslautern, you just said Mainz, I think Mainz might be more familiar to the people here, but uh, actually it's based in Kaiserslautern, K-Town in English. Um, there's also um, a big um, American base here around, so if you check it on the internet, just have a look for that. Um, we are focusing at our institute on topics such as smart cities, for example, digital health, engineering, production and automation technologies, digital ecosystems and platform businesses, as well as uh, green IT and green by IT solutions. So even in our institute, uh, the range of research topics is so broad um, that I think it uh, can address a lot of people. So um, that's quite interesting and uh, also an asset if you are looking for an employer in which you can really uh, find some purpose and um, yeah, do what you really want to do and also in have some impact on what you do. Yeah, what else um, did I want to say? Um, in general, um, we try to um, yeah work together uh, with everyone who is involved in our research topics. This might mean uh, that we are working together with um, other research institutions such as um, universities, for example, but we also work together with industry partners. So. Um, that is uh, also a reason um, why you can benefit from working at Fraunhofer because you have such a big chance to really develop your network and gain experience with different partners. Yeah, okay. basically. Okay, thanks. So if you look into if you look into applied research, looking maybe into industry cooperation, I think Fraunhofer is one of the places uh, to be with a lot of experience and also spread all over Germany, also in smaller towns. No, you mentioned more than sixty institutes. If I'm not 76. not completely seventy six. Are you okay? You increased and over still the last growing. time. Yes, it's still <laughs> growing. <laughs> maybe maybe. Uh, can I do, in, if I come to, to the Fraunhofer uh, Society, can I do a PhD with you uh, or yes. is that not possible? Yes, it depends from institute to institute how it's organized, but in general we offer uh, normal positions as, as a researcher and if you decide to work with us as a researcher, you can first start working or you can directly enter with the ambition to do a PhD, but in general, uh, for every position, it's possible to do a PhD. Yeah, okay, thanks, thanks, uh, thanks for that. Now, uh, I've saw a question on biology and then the Friedrich Löffler Institute came into, <laughs> into my mind. Now, Almut is uh, <laughs> laughing because she knows that she is the next, uh, next up. Uh, let's go to Leibniz, uh, Leibniz uh, um, Association, Almut. Maybe you could give us a brief insight. We've seen in the entrance slide that you're somewhere in the middle of the system. Um, uh, and I think uh, also the Leibniz Association, the institutes are not so well known uh, as, as, uh, as Max Planck Gesellschaft in India. Yeah, has been a long-standing presence. Maybe you could give us a short uh, insight. What is your role in the German research landscape? What you do research on and give us a brief introduction. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Katja. Pleasure to be here. Hello, everyone. And uh, yeah, how come that Leibniz Institutes may not be as well known in India as the others? Well, there's a really, really easy explanation for that. Um, if you are at Max Planck Institute, it's always called Max Planck Institute for this and that. And if you're at a Leibniz Institute, it may not actually bear the, the name Leibniz in its title but it's still maybe a, a member of the Leibniz Association. So we have uh, 97 institutes, member institutes, and many of these are very, very well worldwide renowned um, institutes. And um, we are, well, bang in the middle of your, uh, of your little sketch there, Kat, uh, Katja. And that's because we do both applied and basic research. And that's actually very nice, especially if you're into interdis interdisciplinary research, um, then you might want to check out um, the Leibniz Association and um, see if you can find an institute that suits you. 
So um, those 97 institutes are clustered in a, into a couple of sections. So we have everything from the humanities, for example, history or language studies to the social sciences, such as sociology or um, peace and conflict studies or political science um, and economics, very, very strong with Leibniz. Then we have the life sciences. Then we have the natural sciences, such as physics, engineering, mathematics. And we have a whole section on, in, on um, environmental sciences. So for example, uh, you may or may not know the Potsdam Institute for Climate Research. And actually one of our really, really good professors there is on, on her way to India because she has a huge uh, monsoon forecasting um, project and she's been very, very successful forecasting the monsoon season and she will be traveling India um, to make this known. Yes, so what else can we say about the Leibniz Association? Um, they're very friendly, the institutes and, all, and everyone there. And um, I think everyone's very curious because there's so much interdisciplinary research going on that it's very good to, to be under one roof with people who um, you know, work on the same topic, but maybe from a different um, discipline, really. And also the institutes themselves are um, well connected amongst each other. So if you want to look at be it aging or be it any other topic from a different angle, you will certainly find an expert you can talk to about about your project um, and just as the other three have said um, we welcome phd applicants we welcome postdoc applicants postdoctoral candidates we also welcome professors or senior researchers and we have scholarships at hand so you can either come with third party funding so like with your own funding or you can apply for scholarships or jobs at Leibniz institutes themselves yes Great. I think to jobs, positions, funding, all these things will come a bit later in the talk. Yes. Uh, but maybe, Ahmed, I always find interesting with the Leibniz Association that you have these research museums. Maybe you can elaborate on, on that because I think that's very specific uh, and one would not necessarily know that behind uh, the Naturkunde Museum, the Museum of Natural Sciences, is a large research section. Maybe, maybe a word on that. Yes, Katya, I knew you were going to ask about this because these oh, these have been a favorite of yours for a long time now. Indeed, we have a number of research museums. And so what, what is that? You just mentioned the Museum for Natural History, Museum for Naturkunde, which is um, extremely well known in Berlin. We have the Senckenberg Gesellschaft, for example, but also others such as a mining museum, a shipping museum, uh, art history museums. So these museums are special in a way that one third of what they do is research, proper research. You can do a PhD there, or a postdoc there, they have professors there. One third is collections and one third is exhibitions. So it's great if you want to actually see the application of what you do. If you research bugs, for example, you will, you, you'll be able to exhibit these at a, at a um, museum. And you'll also be able to interact with visitors and show them you know, how you do the research and why this is important. For example, in the, in the field of biodiversity, and um, so it's it's also good if you say you want to follow a you want to pursue an academic career, but maybe you don't want to go and enter the rat race of becoming a full professor. If you actually want a steady job in research, then these research museums um, might actually be a very good bet for you because they offer jobs on sort of like a medium level as well. Thanks. Thanks. So you, you know that I'm a huge fan of those. That's why I'm always uh, asking. Now, I think that leads us to our last institution who was also placed a bit in, in the middle, Alexandra, uh, connected to, uh, to, to Helmholtz. Um, maybe you could elaborate a bit on the Helmholtz Association, who I think has a bit the same, let's say difficulties, but uh, I think everybody knows the German Cancer Research Center in Heidelberg, but not necessarily everybody knows that the Helmholtz Association is behind extending these large these institutions. Maybe you can give us an insight uh, a bit on the institutions you represent here on this panel. Thank you so much, Katya. That is indeed one of our challenges. Thank you for pointing that out. It's, um, it's very similar to Leibniz indeed in that regard. So um, hi, everyone. Thanks for the invitation. It's lovely to be here today. Um, I work in the head office of the Helmholtz Association, which is the largest of the four non-university research organizations in Germany. We have almost 45,000 staff and a budget of almost 6 billion euros per year. 
and we are organized in 18 legally independent research centers all over Germany with a very strong focus on the natural sciences. So as Katja was already saying, not all of our centers carry Helmholtz in the name, so it makes it a bit difficult to um, find the connection to the association. But if I tell you some of our very prominent members, then maybe that is an eye opener for some of you. Uh, for instance, the German Aerospace Center is a member of the Helmholtz Association. So is the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, the Research Center in Jülich, um, the German Cancer Research Center in Heidelberg, which was already mentioned by Katja, or also the German Electron Synchrotron Daisy in Hamburg and the Alfred Wegener Institute for Polar and Marine Research in Bremerhaven. So these are just some of our members. Um, and we are clustered and organized in six research fields and our centers collaborate very closely together, also in an interdisciplinary manner across the boundaries of these research fields. These six fields are energy, earth and environment, health, information, matter, and aeronautics, space, and transport. Um, so we have a number of very prominent and important cross-cutting themes that aim to tackle the grand challenges that humankind is currently facing, such as infection research, for instance, when it comes to pandemics. We also have the Helmut Center for Infection Research in Braunschweig. Um, climate change is obviously a huge topic that we are dealing with currently, transport systems of the future, energy supply of the future, but of course also anything that has to do with information and data science, artificial intelligence, machine learning, etc. So this is another very important um, topic that we are currently working on. Um, international collaboration is a matter that is very close to our heart, so of course we also attract a lot of guest scientists from all over the world. Um, I should also mention that we um, not only develop, but also maintain many large scale research infrastructures in Germany, which is also a defining feature of the Helmholtz Association and a unique selling point, if you will. So we operate uh, particle accelerators, synchrotron radiation sources, field stations, observatories, wind tunnels, satellites, etc. or also research vessels such as the icebreaker Polarstern, which you may have heard about. So uh, these um, facilities also serve as crystallization points in our international collaboration. They attract many guest scientists from all over the world. And then I can tell you that in the past year, we had almost 400 guest scientists from India visiting us. And we also had almost 900 Indian staff members that work with us permanently with an employment contract, just to give you some numbers and some ideas there when it comes to um, colleagues from India working with us. So I'm sure we will get into more details in a second um, when it comes to concrete job opportunities and funding programs that we offer. We do have a number of funding possibilities and also mobility schemes, not only uh, centrally, but also decentrally in our centers. Um, but we will get to that in a minute and I will leave my um, opening pitch at that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alexander. Also one question to you, but I think there's one specific in cooperation with India, and I think it's interesting uh, that India is investing in the Helmholtz Association in a way with the accelerator in, in Darmstadt. Maybe you can let our Indian colleagues know that India is actively participating also in the research infrastructure in the FAIR project in Darmstadt. Yes, that is indeed correct. A FAIR is the facility for um, anti ion and proton research. I always mix up the abbreviation, I'm sorry. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's a large facility that is currently being built by GSI in Darmstadt. GSI is the Helmholtz Center for Heavy Ion Research, and India is actually a national shareholder on that project. So it actively invests funding into the project to actually build the facility and also to, um, to actually set up the hardware there. And they are also involved in the scientific development of experiments. So the, the building site is still very much ongoing at the moment. And I think the aim is to um, finally have the site operational in roughly three to four years time. I believe that is the current time frame. There were some delays also due to construction issues and the pandemic, of course, which affected all of us. But it has a very, very strong um, connection to India indeed. And they also offer some local funding programs for students and PhDs and postdocs from India at GSI, I should mention here as well. Thank you, Katya, for yeah. this question. Yeah, I think it's a very good example that it goes beyond uh, funding only, only mobility. Uh, we have a couple of questions floating in the chat and we 
might not pick up all of them uh, a bit later, um, but um, I think uh, there was one question related to uh, the scholarships of the Indo-German Center for Science and Technology. We picked it up tomorrow. There is a representative, so let me uh, say this. And we have a lot of postdoc questions coming into uh, to the chat. So maybe we start a bit uh, looking into career opportunities at your um, institutions. And maybe I hand over to Yasmin and if the others could add. So if I'm from an Indian perspective, let's say I'm an Indian PhD who comes to an end of my, my PhD no? uh, and I'm looking for, for a postdoc. So what do you have to offer for me? Let's say in your institute, um, um, is it a position, a scholarship and how do I go about it? And if the others maybe then could add on, 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 on their perspective from the institutes. Yes, me, over to you. Oh, yes. um, so in general, um, a PhD, um, uh, yeah. people who did a PhD, they can um, apply for just a normal position with us and they, are, uh, they can develop. We um, offer special career tracks. One is called the project lead track and the other one is the expert track. So um, you can either develop in a leadership role or in an expert role. Um, these are the two career paths we offer. And I just want to add something uh, which I just forgot to mention in the introduction. Um, if you have questions regarding this and um, about how to come to Germany uh, from India, um, we also have um, a representative office in India. And um, my colleague, uh, Ms. Mandalka, she also um, just added the respective link in the chat. So if you have a look at that, um, you can also find some extra information there. So, but you, you, to be clear, you look into uh, recruiting international talent and uh, from India and not just focusing on the European market. Is that right? That's right. Um, I need to add that um, it depends from the institute. Um, if, for example, German skills are required in our institute, for example, it is the case that we uh, would like the people to, um, to know some basic German language. Um, but we also help in, in uh, learning more about this because we offer language courses. So one can just um, uh, learn more and um, develop the language skills. Okay, great to know. So, Almut, uh, you, you mentioned 97 institutes, if I recall it correctly. So as, a, as an Indian researcher, how do I go about, do you have funding? Do I need to apply for a scholarship? What do I do if I would look for a PhD postdoc in, in, in that field? Um, so how, how get I more information uh, um, on, on, yeah, on scholarships, positions, how, how uh, Leibniz is handling the, 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 um, these requests? Yeah, so 97 is actually quite a daunting number. So what you want to do is you go to the website of the um, Leibniz Association. And first of all, I think you should check out the, the, the sections. So if you're a bi biologist, for example, you go to the life sciences section and then you want to browse those 20 something institutes in the life sciences and see if anything fits, if anything, you know, speaks to you and, and maybe you recognize an institute or uh, um, you can just Google these institutes as well. Um, and then um, I think the really essential step is to find a PI, be it a senior researcher or a professor whose um, research interests you a lot and whose research actually attracts you. And then you want to write an application, you know, contact that director directly or that professor directly and tell them who you are, maybe send a little TV, um, a CV and send um, maybe a short um, you know, description of what you want to do and why you think you're the right candidate. But it's really important that you don't just send 1000 emails to all kinds of professors because nothing, nothing is more annoying than getting a, a, a super lame email saying, hello, sir. My name is so and so, and I want to do a PhD in molecular biology. Please help. You really have to do your homework in advance. You have to find the right fit because otherwise your email is going to land in the trash can and that's correct. So really do your homework, you know, research the right people and then send a focused email and just introduce yourself and what you want to do. If you are a hot candidate, then that professor will help you find funding, be it via third party funding, scholarships, jobs, whatever, 
um, be it via, via um, internal funding of that institute, because there are lots of funding sources. So you want to find the right fit and then people will help you find funding because they need good people, they need good young researchers who are devoted to that topic and um, there is funding available, definitely. Thanks, thanks for that. I would hand over immediately to Christiane because in our pre-chat we exactly talked about uh, about that. But how is it with Max Planck? Are you offering positions? I mean, a real position as a PhD, or does my my uh, stay in Max Planck comes with a scholarship? I mean, there's a dif difference. And uh, what should I should I do the same things when I write to a professor to Leibniz holds that true also for Max Planck? So thank you to Almut. I think she explained it very well, and I think. This um, is, is the same for all of our institutions that you need to apply directly to the institute or to a respective director, professor, PI. And I think I would explain it so well, so I don't have to add anything because it's pretty true for Max Planck as well. Well, um, as I said before, um, autonomy is one of the principle, the guiding principle of the Max Planck Society, which means scientists decide upon science, and this also means scientists decide upon, uh, upon their stuff. So, um, first of all, you need to apply for to an institute, and there are positions and scholarship on, on, on a, for a postdoc um, in both ways. So, a, a position is for a longer stay, like three to four years to conduct the research. And um, a scholarship is more for a shorter stay, not longer than two years as a postdoc. So, and, and if you have the possibility to apply for a position, I always um, would advise to do so because they have paid better and social security comes with the position. Um, but finally, the director decides on, on what he offers you. You also can come with your own funding, like a DID or Alexander von Humboldt funding. Um, this is also possible. But if you are unsecure and you don't know how to apply, we also have a representative in Delhi, in the DVEH. This is Poonam Suri, my, uh, my um, colleague there. So I think if you have questions on Max Planck, you can write to me, of course, as well, but also to Poonam, who helps to find the right way, the right funding for the thing you want to do. But I think, as um, Almut said, first start with your homework, look into the institutes, where is the field where you want to do research and how where you want to continue your career, and then maybe look if there is research done which fits to your research interest, okay. and then you can approach us. Thanks, thanks so much uh, for, for that insight. So I think the takeaway is one one has to do really its own research on, on things. Maybe a small hint to the audience from my side. There is the um, there is Gerrit, the German research directory. Uh, maybe a colleague can post it in the chat uh, where you find all the uh, research fields in Germany and can exactly search for your research and you find all these institutes represented here. That could be a good point of departure. Maybe a small hint to our audience. And I also would like to highlight we will send a list with all the links and some uh, uh, standard PowerPoint presentations on the institutes uh, after the web talk so that you can uh, dive deep a bit uh, into 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 more on these institutes. Alexandra, um, question question to uh, to you. So we've learned a lot of opportunities now the, and we've learned that the German research landscape is really scattered. Uh, now, does Helmholtz has a centralized portal where all the positions is or do I really have to go to 18 web pages and look what the uh, if positions are open or not? Thank you, Katja. That's a good question. Um, and indeed, um, thanks to modern technology, we have a centralized database. Um, I'm sure the link will also be posted in the chat. So uh, that's basically yeah, the, the database where you can filter and find all the positions that are advertised at our 18 Helmholtz centers. Because um, just like um, Christiana, Almut and Jasmine were already saying, also in our case, the positions are offered on a decentral local level at the centers. However, we also have a number of centralized funding programs, for instance, for postdocs, we have a young investigator group program, and we also have a program for female scientists for their first professorial appointment. So these are annual calls that are also published on our website, and I know that my colleagues from the other organizations offer similar programs. 
So I'm not sure whether I should go into any more detail right now, but just to mention that besides the regular positions that are advertised as vacancies, we also have these funding calls every year. Okay, that's that's good to know. Now let's take up a couple of questions in the chat. I think one was really a short one, but interesting one. Is there any age limit uh, if I want to apply to your institutions? I don't know who would like to pick it up. Maybe Yasmin, um, but that was a question from the chat. So, so is there any... Do you put any age, age limit for, for Indian scientists coming over to Germany? No, there's no age limit. Um, we are happy to welcome anyone who's fitting to our research. And um, yeah, also female um, scientists are very, very welcome. I want to highlight this because um, yeah, it is it is uh, uh, quite uh, good to, to foster uh, female careers as well. So that's. I think the same would hold true for the other institutions or has Alexandra, you would like to, to add on this. Oh, please go ahead. Thank you. I would like to second that indeed, but I also just wanted to mention just to, um, to avoid misunderstandings. There are indeed seldomly any age limitations. We do have them in case of our calls. And I, I'm pretty sure it also applies to some of my other um, colleagues and co-speakers here today. In the case, for instance, of the young investigator groups, um, the, the issue is that your PhD cannot be older than um, two to six years. So there's a certain time frame, there's a certain limitation there um, for the Young Investigator Group program. So you need to apply within your second or sixth year as a postdoc. And there are some exemptions, for instance, if you are a female scientist and you had a child, etc., then this is some extra time that is added on top. But that is, in fact, indeed the only time when age, or not even, not necessarily age, but the time that you obtained your PhD is a factor in the selection process. Other than that, no. Christiane, you wanted to add uh, on, on, on that point. I think uh, Alexandra already said what I wanted to say. This, there is no age limit in German research at all. It always... Um, response to the time when you have done your PhD and the time, maybe some years after your PhD. Um, but if you have, if you have done your PhD with 30, then the time frame is 30, four, five, six or something. But if you have done it with 25, then it's maybe earlier. So it always corresponds to your research experience. And I think this is quite important to know about research landscape in Germany. And this also applies for our universities and our other research, um, organizations. Okay, thanks. Thanks so much. Uh, I think we have a very interesting, so before we head a bit further in, in discussing about careers, we have an interesting question in the in the chat, if there are any end, common entrance exams in Germany for a PhD, like GATE or, or NEED in, in India. No? So we have this in India, you have a couple of centralized examinations which you have passed in order to be able to do a PhD. Maybe, uh, Almut, you could take this up in, in the first go. Is there such a thing in pl place? Would a German professor look at the GATE uh, score in an exam? So how does this look like in Germany and also in the case of Leibniz? Yeah. No, not that I know of. I mean, I think you have to, uh, to, to prove a certain English proficiency sometimes, most of the time, but that really shouldn't be a problem for Indian students. Anybody else to add? I think Fraunhofer is not running a central entrance test. I would not be aware of this. <laughs> no, we don't. Um, maybe we do something like an assessment center uh, just to check if you're fitting for the respective position, but um, not not a general entrance test. Yeah, I think it, there's always an interview, I think, in, in, in the German system, if I'm not completely mistaken. And nowadays, this takes very often also place in a way, uh, in a way uh, um, uh, online. I had a question on German language. We answered that question also in the opening statement of Christiana. I think in most of the institutes, English is perfectly fine. Uh, Yasmin mentioned that in Fraunhofer, there might be restrictions, but I, I'm confident that in the institutes, um, German language uh, should, should, uh, uh, should, uh, should work. Now, let's take it a bit further i mean um, as a as a as a phd student maybe who has an offer or postdoc student to, to come to germany and or, or to go to the us for instance so what are the career perspectives are there support mechanisms so that i can advance myself in uh, in the research landscape in germany or is it just i get the position and then i left alone and this this it would be maybe alexandra over to you and if the others would like to add on this Thank you. Yes, um, indeed, we have developed a number of support mechanisms for our scientific staff. Um, it's a very important cornerstone also in our career development policy 
All of our centers have career development centers internally. So these are offices that anyone, PhDs, postdocs, senior scientists, um, also our administrative and technical staff, of course, can visit to get some personal guidance, and mentoring and coaching. Um, and also we are um, we have a focus also on non scientific careers just to mention it here. Um, obviously, not everyone is going to be able to stay in the system. It's very competitive. We all know that. So at some point, maybe you will consider a different type of career in science. Maybe you want to go more into scientific management or into the technical side, especially with Helmholtz. I mentioned earlier that we also operate large scale research infrastructures. So we have a vast number also of more technical jobs that are not strictly speaking scientific positions. So um, within Helmholtz, that is another really attractive option. So these career development centers will be there to guide you to forge your individual career path and to also get some mentoring and coaching on the side. And also um, we have our Helmholtz Leadership Academy, which is also a very important feature within our association. And um, this is, for instance, open to anyone who is a junior group leader within Helmholtz. And there you will also get some management skills. Um, so this is also these are things that are you know, taught um, in a very individual manner so that you can also um, really get the best career development possible within Helmholtz. But again, not everyone will be able to stay in the system. So we also have a focus on transfer, entrepreneurship and innovation. This is, I think, also something that has been developed very strongly in the German scientific landscape throughout the past years. So we also have some funding programs, for instance, for spin-offs and startups. So if you are more on the entrepreneurial side of things, you can also get some help for that. And then maybe you will also um, not be a classic scientist anymore at some point, and we are also there to help you, um, yeah, forge that career path. If you're we take this up in a minute. Many ways. We take yes. this up in a minute. This was on my list too. This was also in the chat. I have to say, uh, but um, Almut, Christiane, Yasmin, you would like to to add something on career career development perspectives. Also, given the situation that not everybody can stay in the system, no. <laughs> Sure, I can if, if I can just jump in. Um, we have had a code of conduct for quite a few years now at the Latin Association, just like the others do probably as well. Um, and this means that we take career development very, very seriously. And, it, um, you know, there have been huge discussions in Germany over the past few months and years about um, what happens to all the postdocs who cannot get a professorship and will they be kicked out of the system where I think it's really well, we think it's really important to have transparency about the about the true prospects of careers um, and to be honest with people straight away so we have committees um, external committees whom you can talk to, um, who will advise you and who will be very open to you and tell you, you know, you should really go for it or maybe you shouldn't go for it. And just as um, Alexandra said, um, you know, there are great opportunities, even if you have a PhD and you've done a couple of years of, of a postdoc, um, you can go into science management, you can go into all kinds of careers and um, you don't have to, have to necessarily um, pursue a, an academic career. There's lots of jobs in the industry and, and in foundations and, and everywhere else. And I think people have been extremely friendly and open um, about sharing their advice, not to speak of all the leadership academies um, that you can visit and um, just, you know, just a, as, as a wealth of information available, um, you know, just be open to it and take the advice. So, uh, a lot of opportunities. Cristiano, yeah, please go, go ahead. I also want to add that I think, especially um, hiring or recruiting people from abroad, I think it's also a very important issue for the German um, university or science landscape is then also to have opportunities to return back in the home country, because I think we don't want to gain brain and then just use it for, <laughs> for German science or German um, economy. So uh, Max Planck invented a partner group program where, well, it's it's only for very few excellent uh, researchers in their fields, but you can apply after at least one year of postdoc at a Max Planck Institute for this partner group together with your um, um, with the director of your institute, and then you get some and and you need to have a position back home in in, in your home country. Uh, but then you get some ad funding um, to conduct your research in um, in your home institute, but stay connected to Max Planck. And this is something how we 
also improve our network to India. And, and I think the Indian network in, in is for Max Planck is quite um, established because of these partner groups, because this is where long lasting cooperation then grow out of that we have these scientists returning. So they, they did some research for, on a PhD or postdoc level at Max Planck, but then returned back in their home country. And I think this is next to career um, development, which we all take very serious. This also should be a focus also to, um, in recruiting international talents. Yeah, I think that's that's true. Also, the DID has a network of 10,000 alumni, a lot of them being here, Max Planck, people we know, uh, but also from Leibniz. So we have a lot of people in the system. And by the way, who could help you? Maybe those in the audience, if, if uh, you have somebody in your institute, please ask around. Maybe there is somebody who made it to Germany because there's a couple of questions on application procedures. Could be really helpful maybe to talk to an Max Planck alumnus, to an AFAHA alumnus in your institute, and they could guide you. So this would maybe be a, a small hint from uh, from uh, my side. And there's a question on visa and uh, and how one can stay in Germany. Germany has a quite a uh, generous uh, policy to stay back after graduation. So you can stay back 18 months in Germany to look for a job. But I really would like to highlight, we talked about that we don't really do need English while doing research. If I go for a job in industry and yes, mean maybe you could also elaborate this for sure. Then German it would be because uh, I mean, you work a lot of small and medium sized companies in Fraunhofer. I think then uh, without German, it might get a bit, little bit tricky as me no? Yes, actually, the question goes well together with what we just said about training and educating people at Hornhofer, um, because actually the the reason or, or the aim of the Hornhofer Society is to um, to develop people so well that they can have a good career in industry afterwards. So um, the goal of Fraunhofer is to um, help people broaden their network, get contacts into industry, and then with trainings and educative measures, um, pave their way to industry so they can continue their career path in industry and maybe also pay back a bit to what Fraunhofer has done to them because most of the um, corporations you all know it, uh, they come by knowing people and um, staying in contact with each other. So that's maybe, yeah, that's... Um, uh, did, I, did I answer your question correctly or, or is this the same? Yeah, I mean, maybe maybe you could, I mean, you work a lot with industry, no? So I, I, I think maybe, maybe with regard to German language, I think it could get a bit tricky, no? If you not have a good command of German once you start to work with industry or what, what would be your feeling? Depends. It depends uh, on the project you're working on. Um, so that's why I just said um, it also depends on the institutes. Uh, who are their partners? Do they speak German or English? Are the projects uh, based in Germany? Uh, how's the language in the project? Um, if you go to industry who's working internationally, then of course English is Fine, but yeah, a good command of German. I, I would recommend it, and that's why we also offer the trainings for that. It's always yeah good to to have a uh, uh, to have a, a good good command of German. Being in Germany to navigate also to the small cities, I I would like to add on this. Christiane, you wanted to add uh, on that. I think you, you you probably said what I wanted to say. I think it pretty much depends on the city where you're living in and and on the company you're working. So I, I'm a very Munich. We have a lot of a huge community that which doesn't speak German at all. I wouldn't advise that because if you live in another country and you can't say a word, it makes living maybe not so nice. And and, and um, but I think Germany is changing in this regard quite a lot because we're looking for workers all over the world. So I think the, the working community is also like the scientific community getting more and more international. And so English is it's, it's easier to get along with English. But I think still I think nobody of us will advise not to learn German at all, especially for the daily life. I think it's more comfortable to know some German. It's always advised. I'm also trying to learn some Hindi for that reason, being based in Delhi. Um, I would like to, I would like to highlight. We have a lot of questions coming in on social sciences and humanities. So we have a special web talk on Thursday where we really talk about colonial studies, social sciences opportunities, going a bit more into these, these questions. So if you would join in, uh, you find the link on, on the website. And there's also questions on DAD funding and the general funding programs offered by DAD, the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation. We have a talk tomorrow, so we will not 
take this up in the talk here, we focus on the institutions. So please join in tomorrow if uh, if you have uh, questions related general funding programs open to all today. The focus is uh, more on the institutions who are represented on that panel. I think we spoke a lot about positions. We talk about a lot of long term stays. Uh, there were a couple of questions on short term stays in, in Germany. So a research period six to 12 months, for instance, would that be possible or maybe uh, if I'm, I'm in my PhD studies also and would like to come maybe for, for some using your wonderful facilities, Alexandra, uh, in, in Hamilton. So would that be feasible for the four of you or would you look only into long term, long term stays of international scientists? Uh, maybe Yasmin, you go first and then we could 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 add on that. Mm, yes, so uh, in general, everything is possible. Speaking from the point of view from our institute, I would rather say that we are looking for people um, wanting to stay a bit longer because, um, of course, um, it's nice to have someone here for six months, but um, you all know onboarding takes some time and uh, until the person is uh, involved in the project, uh, it might already be over, to be honest. So, um, from our side, we are rather looking for people for a long term stay. Yeah, how, how does this mirror for the other institutions present, Alexandra? Thank you for this question. Um, well, for us, it's a, it's a mixed bag. I mean, both is possible. So, short term stays are also encouraged. Um, there are quite a number of offers on the decentral local Helmholtz Center level. So for that, I would echo what has been said earlier. You would probably need to do your own individual research on the websites of the centers. Just to give you one example, GSI, which was mentioned earlier with its FAIR uh, site in Darmstadt, they have a program called Get Involved for Mobility, and they also have a specific branch for Indian PhDs, master's students, and postdocs. And I believe this is anything between three months and two years, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I can post the link into the chat as well, if you like. So this is just specific on the level of GSI, but I'm sure there are more programs like this also at the other Helmholtz centers. We also have one centralized funding program for short term mobility, which is specifically for the information and data sciences. Our Helmholtz information and data science Academy HIDA offers the so called visiting researcher grant. And this is also um, available at all of our centers, as long as there's a focus on information and data science in the profile of the applicant. But again, there's also individual arrangements. If you just send an email to your potential PI or to a professor whose work you find interesting, you can also make very individual arrangements. So I would say go for it and don't be held back by the lack of uh, programs. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Thanks for that. I'm um, uh, Christiane, anything to add from, from your end? To, to that? Yes, I would like to add two things. First of all, I think it pretty much depends on what you want. So I think if you have a PhD position and you do your research in India, but there is a core facility at probably all of our four institutions you want to use, there are opportunities for short time stays. So then you come for, uh, in, um, in, in, in Max Planck, you can come for up to six months as a PhD and also up to two years on a postdoc position on a scholarship to, to conduct only the research, but you're not on a position, you don't get a research topic, but you do maybe your research on this core facility or whatever, or you want to, to co-work with someone you're very inspired of or so. But also you can apply for a longer stay and do all your research on this career level at one of the institutes. But I also want to point out <clears throat> a special program Max Planck Society has for India, these are the Indian Mobility Grants, which is aimed to PhDs in the very last year of their PhD up to junior junior faculty at the university. So I think on an assistant professor level, you can apply for this mobility grant at one of our institutes and the institute get 5,000 uh, euro a year to fund your research there. So that means they cover your travel costs and then you can come for at least one month a year in a row of three years. And then you can, if you have something where you want to do research in a field or in a, uh, at Max Planck, well, then you can do it um, in three different years and stay with this institute in this kind of, of um, yeah, uh, arrangement. So uh, you can find some information on the mobility grants on our website and also Punam Suri, is 
pretty much helping you if you want to to apply for this kind of grant. Thank you. Thank you for it. I'm with you. Are good or? Um, yeah, I have very little to add. I think always give it a shot. If you think there is somebody, um, you know, who, who fits your interests, your research interests perfectly, uh, just write them an email. And I think much can be done even if you don't have a formal scholarship program. Okay, I think there's a lot of possibilities. This is a bit of the take, uh, take, uh, take, uh, take uh, away. Before we jump into the last set of questions regarding a bit innovation and transfer, and Alexandra, you tackled it also a bit. I have here one specific question, and then maybe I, I, I give that to, to Almut. So there is the question is there, should I turn to an agency to get a position in Germany? Or should I give it a try on my own? How is the German system working? Um, so what uh, sh should I do if I would aim? Uh, is, is an agent uh, the right person to address to? Well, I didn't even know that agencies exist. <laughs> I mean, unless you talk, you talk about things like the DAAD and you'd call that an agency. I think that's great. You know, if you are these, these kind of agencies that get, that give away scholarships and that have, that have a selection process and then you come with your own funding such as a DAAD scholarship or a DFG scholarship or an you know a Humboldt grant or a Volkswagen grant that's fantastic um, but otherwise just be sure that you have found the right person you really want to work with and then I don't think you need an agency or an agent yeah so be, be aware a bit of this as would be also a hint from my side so uh um, German institutions don't tend to give position to agents, no? So everybody's shaking their head <laughs> already. So please be be aware of that. And I think one of the specific specific uh, yeah uh, criteria in Germany is you have to make it on your own. And already finding a host, writing a good application shows that you're well able to to do this. Uh, that turns me a bit to the question on future careers and innovation in startups. Oh, no, I give this to Christiane first because, uh, you're, yeah, <laughs> you're into, you're into, in, into basic research, no? And, uh, I'm basically on, uh, um, would you look into these topics or would you say, uh, if you look into innovation and startups, you better be off, uh, with one of the other institutions on the panel? Oh, this is a very uh, difficult question to me because I'm absolutely not a transfer, but we have a uh, Max Planck Innovation as a, um, an institute where you can apply for fundings to, um, to bring your um, science into application. So this is something which is, even when we do cutting edge research on a very basic level, of course, we look into it if there's some potential for, for industry or startups or so, and there's an agency. But this is mostly all I can say to this, this field because it's absolutely not something of my, my specialty. Yeah, I think it's it's a bit limited, no? And if I if I look to Yasmin and then also maybe to Alexandra, so Yasmin, how does it look for Fraunhofer? Can I spin off easily? Do I get support well, finding a team know, member? Uh, spin off is never easy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, the the possibility is there. Um, for example, in our institute, you also had uh, a project going on and it developed so well that the people in this project said, okay, let's do a spin off. Um, there is um, also a certain program um, by Fraunhofer which supports you when doing this, but um, every spin-off starts with a project and if this project works well, then you can do and plan your spin-off and um, yeah, also be aware of the fact that this takes a long, long time So until the spin-off is really spinned off. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, yeah, the Alexander, you, you, you tackled it a bit that says it might quite build up a nice infrastructure for that. There was a question here that uh, is an innovative startup. Which institutions should the innovative startup apply to? Are there any specific programs also to port, uh, support international startups coming from research? We have to highlight this. We're not talking about uh, market or B2B commerces here. Yes, thank you for that question. Well, um. Obviously, our main mission is to conduct basic research, so we are not 
by mission um, as strongly focused on transfer and innovation as in comparison, let's say Fraunhofer. However, as I mentioned earlier, we do have a very increasing focus on transfer and innovation within Helmholtz. But that rather means that this comes out of our own ecosystem. So we not really attract entrepreneurs from the outside as strongly as um, that we encourage um, PhDs or postdocs internally that have exciting research that could be transferred to market. So there are more mechanisms in place to, to stimulate entrepreneurship within our own Helmholtz scientists, within the centers. So there are, for instance, transfer scouts whose job it is to identify exciting projects that could have potential for market valorization. And we also have a number of centralized funding tools, for instance, Helmholtz Innovation Labs that connect our scientists to industry to bring an idea to the market or Helmholtz Enterprise, which is for an even earlier stage in the process where our scientists are encouraged to, um, to set up a spin-off. I'd be happy to post another link into the chat about this. So um, yeah, this is more for, let's say, the, the internal ecosystem. But of course, anyone coming to us from India with a, with a great idea, working with us and for us in one of our centers and interested in, in transfer, uh, will be encouraged to also apply for funding as part of our internal policies, if it makes sense. So there's no distinction and you can always go go also for, for, for that. Uh, I would anything to add for, for Leibniz or would that be that's perfect a topic to... <laughs> that's perfect <laughs> okay good I think uh, we should slowly close our discussion it's really engaging I find it quite interesting um now before we uh before we, we close maybe I would have a question to each of you so if you would have the one and only hint for uh, an Indian scientist looking for an opportunity in your institution what would be the hint you would give that Indian Scientists and Almut volunteered, so Almut, you go first. Do your homework properly. Do not send more than one or two emails at the most to people. Be very specific. Otherwise, no chance. Okay, then I can over to Kaiserslautern, not to Mainz. Yasmin, over to you. <laughs> Yes, I can. I can only uh, support you uh, in, in saying this, Almut. Um, for us, um, we experience it very often that uh, also the CVs they look great, but um, when then having the interview, um, we notice that sometimes there is a lack of the competencies we really want. So um, that's because um, the CVs they often look uh, like a generalist who knows everything but um, we we are really looking for experts in their field and um, for that we need people who keep their focus in their CV so that we can uh, decide um, if the person better matches this or that uh, position and um, yeah that's why I really support what you said I would um, to keep a, a clear clear focus so a focus and not a beautified CV uh, Christiane over to you <laughs> Well, I think everything is said, but I think it's important, but I maybe then advertise something else. And if you are now looking for a PhD post, there is the application phase for our Max Planck schools just starting now to the end of the December. So this is a very interdisciplinary uh, program on cognition, or although there are three cognition, matter to life and photonics. And I, I just read the uh, marketing sentence to you. It's a visionary graduate program to exceptional PhD candidates. So if you feel that you are special, very special for that, please look on our Max Planck School website because the application is just now for the next year's program. So maybe. I think that's the hint, Christiane, for the next year. So it takes time. Uh, you cannot decide to go today to uh, go to Germany and then you are there in two months. Yes, no, I think. Absolutely. So if you want to if you apply now, then you start next year. Yeah, okay. Good. Uh, Alexandra, over to you. Um, I can only second what my, uh, my colleagues already said. I would definitely agree with that. Um, and also, yeah. Um, Make your individual plan, do your research, and also reach out to people that look interesting to you and um, connect with them at fairs or at conferences, for instance. Um, I think now that we can all travel again, this is also a great possibility to connect personally and really make a difference and, um, and make an impact. Um, and yeah, make it individual, make it personal, and um, 
yeah, make a convincing case for yourself. And then I think there are many paths that can open for you in Germany. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much. So this leads us uh, to the end of the panel. First of all, thanks to the panelists for answering all the questions and to our audience for putting in such a lot of questions. We got a lot of questions and for uh, specific subject fields, of course, we could not take uh, take them up. So what, what did we learn today? Uh, the, in, uh, the German research landscape is diverse as the Indian is, I have to say. Um, there's a bit of segregation of work, so don't look for applied research at uh, Max Planck. This is more um, into into the other three insti uh, institutions, uh, Helmholtz and Leibniz. Uh, um, are a bit on the intersection and uh, you might uh, know even uh, Helmholtz even without knowing the Helmholtz institutions because you would know maybe one of the leading centers of, of these uh, these institutions. I think we've learned that there is plenty of opportunities available in Germany, uh, be it for short term uh, stays, uh, be it for long term stays, positions, uh, PhD scholarships, so everything is possible and I think we nearly covered all the subject fields also in this round representing, as I said, 200 75 insti institutions. Um, so I think that's what we, we also learned in, in the web talk. But we, we learned it takes own initiative, it takes homework, and it takes to run through the websites and really look. So there is nobody who will say, come, I take my hand, I will lead you through the process. So I think that's the first step of maturity and to find, find these uh, things. I think that was also one of the takeaways from the sessions. Alexandra mentioned in her final statement, want to uh, B2B meetings. I would like to highlight that the German Center for Research and Innovation will run next year in April, uh, Indo-German Research Day. Uh, where we'll have not just the central representatives, we will have research institutes presence and will offer the opportunity to discuss research policies on the one hand, but also on the one hand to have one-to-one -one meeting, a platform where one can connect. This would be maybe a good next step for also our audience. I would like to highlight that we will take that up. For me, it remains to say thank you. Um, please join in the audience if you have further questions, as mentioned in the other three web talks upcoming this week or in one of the DAD or DVH events. I say goodbye to my panel in Germany. It was wonderful having you on the panel again, uh, discussing these things. I think we should continue the discussion and I wish all of you a great afternoon or all of those who are in India a great evening ahead. Take care, goodbye and hope to see you soon in one of our next events. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye. Thanks a lot, bye. Thanks, bye.